the same piece of wood from the same tree? Yeah. Not necessarily, because if it's a, if it's a part of the tree, let's look at this big tree, is, is it the same wood on this side of the tree than on the other side? No, the grain structure is different. And all these things make a difference. How many of here have heard of a Stradivarius? Mm -hmm. What do you make? Um, violins. Uh-huh, we make violins. Now think about the properties of the wood from back then. You see, you have a lot more stable woods. In fact, today there's even uh, things where you have to be, uh, the type of woods that you use that may, may have been available before aren't available now. One, for example, is Brazilian rosewood. To try to get that uh, requires, you could say, an act of Congress because there's these sites, what's called sites, C-I-T-E-S, requirements. Basically, like if you have a guitar made out of like Brazilian rosewood and you try to go to another country, you almost need like a passport for that guitar. And not only the woods, but maybe the inlay, if it's pearl inlay, or if it's a abalone, mother of pearl, you know. So all of those things are even controlled under, under sites. Let's say they had no guitar and it actually had ivory on it. Well, ivory is illegal today. So you have to have documentation like a passport to, to uh, allow you to have uh, uh, that, those materials to prove that it wasn't stolen or, or brought, brought in. So, you know, it's, so it's not just about a guitar, it's not just about an interest, instrument. You can see the, uh, how things can influence not only how you build it, but where you can have it. Some things that we could use here in the United States for materials they can't use in another country. So it's just an idea, something to think about. Yes? Why is ivory illegal? Because depending on the type of ivory, well, let me see. Does anybody else here think they can answer that before I do it? Yes. It comes from elephant tusks, tusks, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. So poachers hunt elephants with bigger tusks, and that causes natural selection. Now they have smaller tusks. Oh well, yeah. It's well, illegal to poach anyway. Well, plus uh, the endangered species. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then some tusks, again, okay, you can have that, but then also think of not only elephants, what about rhinoceros, what about things like that? So you're correct. Yeah, so you can see that, and people try to take advantage of that. So in the same way you can talk about poachers with animals, you can also talk about poachers with wood, trying to, and it causes deforestation and big, big problems on some of these woods that you can't get anymore, okay? so. That's just something to think about. There's a lot to it. It's not just about, oh, let me go and assemble something. So let's go. Let's see, who wants to help me with some of the other guitars just to get them out? That's a beautiful guitar. This is a steel string. These are all examples of guitars you built. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been building guitars? Uh, let me see. Around 2000. Nine. I'll tell you how I got started building guitars. I'm just a tinker. How many of you just like to figure things out, just try to look around and figure things out, and figure how something works? Okay, that's, that's great. I mean, no matter what we do, sometimes we don't like to tinker, we just like to tinker with the instrument. It's like you have your ukulele there, right? So those are all fun things too. Go ahead and put it on one of, the, on the, one of those other parts of the stand. It's a lot different than my stands. <coughs> Yeah, it'll go just like this. It will go? Yeah, just kind of tilt it out. Do you ever brand your guitar? Okay. Yeah, I'm, my, my, my guitar is a RP, but I put it backwards. Mm -hmm. I put the R and the P back. Well, the R is backwards, and it's a play on, on words because a backwards R in a, for Cyrillic alphabet, you know what a Cyrillic alphabet is? Like what? Um, really well, letters may look the same or a little bit different, but Cyrillic alphabet is anything like East European Russian alphabet. And so if RP would be Yar in Russian. Anyway, so I think it's kind of neat. And actually, when I've had some Russian people kind of mess with my guitars, they'll call them Yar guitars. So I just find it neat. For PR. Yeah. <laughs> 
because the P is an R in Russian, and the R in the R, backwards R is a Y. Yeah, it's an actual vowel. Have you ever made left-handed guitars? Uh, no, but they're really no more difficult than a right hand. You've got to take take into account what you do as far as bracing, and I'll explain that in a minute. Good mm -hmm. questions. What's the neatest design you've ever had to do on the guitar? When you say design, like structure-wise, like they're all different. So I think they're all neat. And I'll tell you what, that's one thing about building guitars is that it's really, it's a relaxing hobby for, for me, but it's also a very addictive hobby. You know why? Because you're always thinking, and even while you're building one, you're already thinking in your head, I can make the next one better. I mean, it's just automatic. Every luthier, which is what you call guitar builders, what do you have here? Every luthier that builds, every, everyone that builds a guitar and has done it for a while, it's always, I can make the next one better. So the question is, which is the best guitar I've ever built? And this is the same answer every luthier will give you. You know what the answer is? Every design is different. No. The answer, right, the next one. That's the answer. <laughs> So which is the best guitar? The next one. Because you're always thinking about what you're going to do or how you can do something better. Okay? Um, I don't know if this is something you can give them later. I made a copy of various websites and places that if they're interested in looking, they can. And then, uh, copy it later. Have yeah. Uh -huh. in the class board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can take a picture of it before they leave. They sure. Yeah, that's something you can do. You can take a picture of it. Pass it around if you want them to. Sure. <laughs> If you want to know websites where you get more information, just take a shot of that and you can look them up at your leisure. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I've got Irvin's page on there. I have uh, O'Brien Guitars. In fact, I learned, I learned a lot from uh, Robbie. He's, uh, he does one-on-one -on -one instruction and he also does online classes. And on one-on-one -on -one instruction, I'm talking about that you could actually go out there and build a guitar with them in a week and you'll have a high-end guitar. You'll have, whether you do a steel string or a, or a classical guitar. And he does those and you build the guitar in a whole week with them, I mean by hand. So it's a really neat process. Some uh, other nice uh, guitars and builders that you can find online instruction. Tom Bills, TB Guitars. Uh, JSB Guitars, that's John Bogdanovich. He's over in North Carolina. He's a friend of mine too, and he, he focuses on classical guitars and one-on-one -on -one, uh, builds. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of Collins guitars? Not Collins, like the store, but Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-G-S, okay? Do you know where they're located? Austin. Austin. Now the cool thing about that, if you ever get a chance, uh, I, doubt, I don't know if you'll ever have a field trip, but on Friday afternoons, he does, they do a tour there, and it's free. So you could go and see the whole process from when the wood comes in to when the guitars go out. But he, does, he doesn't only build uh, acoustic guitars, he also does arch top, he does mandolins. I mean, anybody seen mandolin? You know what that looks like? Okay. Uh, kind of about the size of a ukulele, okay? And then you have double the strings. I but, tried to set up a field trip last year, okay. and they said they are no longer doing large groups. Okay, I was yeah. going to rent a bus and take all the guitars. Oh, okay, students. so it's mostly small groups. So right. this is this is even better. We have a luthier here with us. <laughs> right. But, so, uh, but it, but they can go on their own with yes, their family. Yes, you can go on their own, and but it's a they only does they only do one tour a week, and it's on a Friday afternoon. But it is free. But you can see the whole process straight through. Uh, Mr. Collins is a bill is an interesting guy. I mean, you can see that he uses his shop just to play. So it's like his play place. You know, you're talking about a millionaire here, and he's there tinkering around with everything else. He'll talk to you just like anybody else, but he's there tinkering around with his stuff, and you'll see him if you know who he is. And but he'll, he's very gregarious, very open. And he'll talk to you and, and all of that. You wouldn't even know he's the owner. But he had there a mandolin in a lot of these contests where they do bluegrass music and festivals. Sometimes they'll win a prize and they have, they can select some of the high-end mandolins. Among them, a, a Gibson is a good one, but a lot, everybody goes for the Collings, you know? Anyway, he had one there and he was building and it was small like that. And he's got his workers and everything. So he's here holding it up. He says, 
this is fifteen thousand dollars and I can't make enough of them again I wish I had that prom <laughs> so those are great things so building a quality guitar for quality instrument uh, does cost money and that's why it's not the same as going to Walmart so what do you, what is different well everything's a piece of art you know as far as uh, the actual guitar and playing it so uh, the, the guitar will have things that you won't find any it's it's a one-off there's only one it's like a person making a soup uh, you know a, a, some nice clothes for you and for you and each one is different based on what you requested or the materials and then with that it's all custom even on the inside so let me show you what goes into building different kinds of guitars and why it's expensive but at the same time why you can learn to have an appreciation for it because again it's just like one of a kind there is no other one like it and that you can get so you have to build stuff remember I told you you can't just go and buy all these things at Walmart or whatever well all of these things mean something something as thin as that test that around and here this is a uh, what we call purfling this is what we would call binding the binding is what goes around the edge okay so then you have to take that and you have to bend it and uh, the way you bend it is with steam. So you could bend it on a form, you can bend it by hand. Let's say you're doing a one-off instrument for one person, well then you can do it on a, on a pipe. And you heat the pipe up. Some people use a torch. You can use a heat gun. But as long as you can get it to the right temperature, you're, you're able to bend it. And it'll bend like plastic. It's just neat what you can do with, with the woods. And that's how you bend all these sides and everything else. This here, You've got to make these things, okay? So I use this. I made this so that I can make the shapes for the, and I'll show you how that, for, for example, for the purfling, which is, this is called the binding. This on the inside is the purfling. Let me see, on your guitar. I mean, your ukulele. Okay? So on your ukulele, this would be the binding, and this part here would be the purfling, okay? And what they did is they kind of also, even though it's a, this is a, a, will be somewhat of a simple build, but you also try to color coordinate and match things. So on this particular guitar, they took material that they used for the binding and then used that for the sound hole too, okay? Neat. And then on, normally they make more ornate on the top than maybe on the back. So on the back, all they did was you have your binding with a, somewhat of a perfling scheme on that too. Okay, thank you. So, so you have to have strips, so for example, so this is the purfling, but you have to make this. So imagine all these pieces of wood put in in this direction and then bound with the top and the back, and then from there you cut strips off to, to make that, okay? So where do you use that on a guitar? Being that they have these things over there, So if you look at this guitar, this is a flamenco guitar. You see that, that purfling that you ended up passing with the little black, black and white? You see? And then all of this. See how that goes? Will everybody promise to be really careful? Yeah. Okay, well then I'm gonna go ahead and pass this down. You can check it out, you can look at it. But you can also feel, what, what do you notice about it by just holding it? Very light, isn't it? That's a flamenco guitar. Flamenco guitars are really light by, by the way you want to build. That's something that you want to keep in mind. And it has to do with the types of wood. It also has to do with the bracing. So you all saw these already? What did I, did I cut this around? So that's how you make that. And you'll see it when you... That, that guitar also has a, an armrest or an arm bevel on, on that particular guitar. And that makes it really nice and comfortable for your arm. Something else that a, an arm bevel does that helps on a guitar, uh, it, you're trying to maximize your sound. And 
what could happen what happens normally if you put your when you have and it's a natural way of playing where you put your arm in the guitar mm -hmm. what's going to happen what are you covering any ideas you're covering the part that's supposed to be vibrating the actual soundboard well by by resting your arm on the armrest you're allowing the guitar to to uh, sound because of the, it's uh, spreading the sound okay so so that's an example of a flamenco guitar. This is an example of a classical guitar. Classical guitars and flamenco guitars are very similar, but with, uh, and the slight difference is being, part of it is uh, your goal on building the guitar. And therefore, what might be lighter than others, but it's also what you're trying to accomplish with the guitar. Uh, what I mean by that is a type of sound. Um, on a classical guitar, you want your notes to ring and sustain for a long time. Okay? You want it to... And then it's going to keep on going. See? And that's the difference, too, when you have one hand built versus something you buy. You'll notice the sustain will be less. You don't have color. Oh, there's a lot less color in a guitar that you uh, that that you just buy. Anybody know what I mean by color? <coughs> let me t let me show you. Like here, if I play this here, and this just an open string, okay. But watch when I move it down here. As I move up and down, depending on where I'm playing, I may, may get a more mellow sound or I may get a more metallic sound, right? So uh, have any of you ever heard of Andres Segovia? Yes, no? Andres Segovia, you could, you could say he's the, the father of the classical guitar. And uh, if you ever look him up, you can find some videos of him. Some consider him the greatest guitarist of, of all time. Very different from today because of the style. He basically invented a lot of the styles on uh, how to play finger style and, and that. Oh, think about it. They didn't have any kind of training, and here's this man figuring things, young young man figuring things out and making it consistent and making a whole repertoire that you could play. So uh, on, on that, and you'll still find videos from him. He played all the way up until his 80s when he died. But uh, so he he always said a guitar was neat because it was like a it was like a uh, a band in a box. You could make it do all sorts of different types of tones and stuff. In his eyes, it would be similar like saying a synthesizer today, like, uh, but accomplishing it on a guitar is, uh, is pretty neat. In fact, you can find on YouTube a whole, uh, there was two, he did two interviews, they did two documentaries in the 60s from him. So he was already old, he was already retiring by that age. But uh, he he really explains well uh, why he why he played and did what he what he did. The guy was kind of a control freak, but he he really uh, inspired people to continue playing and learning how to play. In fact, that before he started playing, there was no like teaching in schools like this, or even at conservatories. The the guitar was looked upon as a poor man's instrument, gypsies, and people like that, you know. But he actually made it a a more refined uh, looking at it from a classical aspect. So it, it's, a, it's a wonderful history if you ever get a chance or you're interested in looking at it. So that's that. This is a, this is a classical guitar. Now the nice thing about that is that this guitar has not only a sound hole, but it also has a sound port. Can anybody have any idea why, why do that? Why don't all guitars have that? Okay. How many of you have ever how many of you have ever used your lawnmower at home? Okay? So when you run out of gas, you put gas in, right? So you gotta put gas in it. What do you do to put gas in the lawnmower? Get gas can. Okay, you take the top off, but what else do you do? You also have to open up what? On the gas can, what else besides opening the top? What else do you have to open up? Tell me what that is. Yes, yes, you said it right. 
Yeah, in the back, the little vent. Because what happens if you don't open up that little vent? Right, so and sometimes the, the can will actually get crushed in, or another thing will happen, it'll just come out like, go, right? Um, so, so, so you want it to come out as a stream while you're, while you're pouring it out. So the guitar with just the one sound hole is like that. The, sound, the, the air is going in and coming out of the same place, while if you end up putting a sound port on it, it allows the air to flow freer. Hence, even on a smaller size guitar, this is a pretty small, even by... Those, are those nylon string guitars that you have there? Can you, would you mind getting one? Okay. If you notice the size of the body on this guitar versus this one, this one's smaller. So even on a smaller size guitar, you're going to get a big sound out of this. This is like the what would be called a Torres size. Torres was one of the first builders that kind of refined Antonio Torres on, on building uh, classical guitars in Spain. Okay? So you can pass that around too. Again, uh, all those purfling schemes and everything is all by hand. You see this here? This is called the rosette. And this is something built by hand. So this is a uh, this, the nice thing too about being in this area, you get to build stuff with some woods that are from here. So I like to make those kind of unique heat and unique here. So that rosette, this is what's called a, um, spalted or bur this is spalted uh, pecan. So this is from a pecan tree, but you'll feel it. And then I use that, if you notice, that's just a piece of it. You can pass this one around too. So that comes from that big board. I have to cut that down. And after I cut it down from the big board, okay? So that's, that's you, so, and you have to cut them down and get them into, a, imagine cutting it that thin making it that thin, then making it level, then cutting out the circle, then, then fitting it in, you have to inlay it into that top. So do you understand why wouldn't it, uh, if you're doing this not just in a factory, you're doing it as a one-off, one you're doing these one at a time. Uh, you can see where the cost would come in versus just going, to, like I said, to, to Walmart and finding something for $100 or for whatever, it's just different. Here's another piece of purfling, and so when we think about the time invested just making something like this, here's a piece of what we would call like a herringbone pattern. And again, all of these little pieces, like the, this blue here, and the yellow, and the other blue, and then that one way in the middle, those are all individual pieces of wood they have to put together to make this thing. What kind of wood is that? That's pecan. And I use that for the sound hole for the rosette. So what makes up a good top? One thing that you're trying to do with a top, with, with a guitar and when you're building by hand as a luthier, what you're trying to do, you're, you're, you're playing with several things from a science side, okay? We talked about the artistry and, and how you can make things really, really pretty depending on the types of wood and making things match. Like here, just to make things match, you see how even when you're building it, you're kind of doing it as in color coordinated way. Like I made my bridge. This is called uh, um, they call it leopard wood. Some people call it lace wood, uh, and so you can find it at different places. So I made my bridge, my armrest, and also the binding, the same material, and even the end wedge here, and then even the back. So you see, so all of these things tied together, and then you gotta make a match. Even trying to do a mitered corner where those white lines match. So there's, a, you see there's a lot to it. And that's part of the, the beauty and the art of, of making the, the guitar. Did anybody get a chance to look at the inside of the guitar? Like through there? What did you notice if you look through the sound hole and then look at the wood on top? Did anybody notice anything? Did y'all do it, try to do that? Mm -mm. Yeah, if you look at the soundboard, you tell me what you know. Like go through there and then look at the top over here. Like look as if you're looking towards the top. <coughs> tell me what you see. I 
can you see through it almost? Yeah. That's the point. That okay. shows you how thin it is. Did you did y'all notice that? Go ahead, pass it around. Look through there and then look at the top. Okay? You, you see the bracing, but then you also can see light through there, right? That goes to show you how thin that top is. That top is only maybe two, maybe at most two millimeters thick. Okay, it would be like that. So, so it, it's almost like seeing a piece of paper. So here you are with a piece of wood and you want that to hold at least, let's say 80 to 120 pounds of tension on a piece of paper, so that's why you gotta put the bracing in there. But yet, when you make it thin enough, and yet, not too thin that it's going to implode, but you gotta make it thin enough so it's going to maximize the vibration, and yet, you know, so, but at the same time, while it's maximizing vibration, you wanna still keep structural integrity. Here's an example of a guitar top this is for a steel string guitar and all this bracing means something and here's the difference between when you make a guitar custom versus something you just buy in the store in a store if you were to look at the bracing all of these are just straight pieces of wood they just glue them on and then just glue the guitar together this person glues the brace the other one goes and puts it on top of the guitar or a machine does it okay but when you're building the, the guitar custom you actually start shaving away at the wood what do you think that does by shaving away at the wood in the right places? Any ideas? First of all, what are you taking away by doing that? Mm. Weight. Weight's an important thing. Mass. So the more mass you take away, the more you're allowing this thing to vibrate. Okay? But if you take away too much from the wrong places, what can happen? This can actually break yeah. when it's on top. So you see where you're playing with... You're, a, a good luthier is playing to the edge of structural integrity where it's going to stay together, but you're going to get maximum responsiveness versus something that someone's just going to buy and just throw around or put in his attic or put in his tent for while they're on vacation or whatever. So there's a difference in, in how you do this. Now, what you do is, here's an interesting thing. I'll let you all do it. <coughs> but take the, take the top, you put your thumb here, and then put your ear on, on this side, and then and tell me what you, after you do it, I'm just going to ask you what, you what you felt you heard, okay? So again, you put your thumb here, and then you tap on the back, okay? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you while you do this first, okay? So put your thumb on it, excellent, okay? Make, make sure you're making it loose, okay? You don't mind if I touch it like, okay? Go ahead now, touch, get it away from your side, make sure it doesn't touch you. Go ahead, lean, you can lean your head. Okay, now tap the back. Well, in fact, I'll tap it for you. Okay, did you hear anything? Yeah. What do you hear? It's like a drum. Exactly. And did you notice that it lasted a long time? Yeah. That's part of the sustain. That's part of the responsiveness. I'll tell you what, why don't you all help each other? Maybe you can hold it for her and then you tap. Okay? She, that way they won't touch her on the ear, you know, unless you get used to it, you know? So maybe each one of you can do that and then you do that for her. Would you mind doing that? Yeah. Just so that you can each get that feel. Okay, so you hold it for her. Basically, what I would do if I were you, I'd put my right hand here and then tap like that and just put it up to her ear. And then you do the same thing. Everybody got that? Okay. What kind of wood is that? Okay, that's uh, that one there is Sitka, Sitka, Sitka top, and again, uh, Sitka bracing. Sitka spruce. Spruce is a type of pine. Okay. Something else about woods can you just take any kind of wood and make a guitar? You probably could, but will it sound the best? Not necessarily you can still maximize the sound of the material you have, okay? Uh, something else about the woods. Can someone tell me, you see, you probably never looked at the guitar like this before, the detail on that. When you look at the top of the guitar, can someone tell me about what they see on the guitar? What do you see? Like on the top, when you look at the top. Not, not this parts, but like here. Tell me what you see. If you were an ant and you were sitting on top of this guitar, what do you see? You see these lines, don't you? Can anybody tell me what those lines are? 
those are the growth rings on the guitar uh, on, of the tree. Oh, but if you notice, they're, they're straight. Yeah. Why do they say straight? Because it's called. That's another reason why it costs more to make a guitar, especially if you're getting a custom guitar. It's called a quarter sawn lumber. Can I draw something up here? Yes, you see that green marker? Okay. Hopefully so, it's not some ink, but yeah. you so, can erase anything you need. So, how about I just erase this? I'm not important anymore. Right? <laughs> you already know me. Just call me Mr. S. Okay, so here's a, a tree. If I'm looking at it like I cut the log, right? And the tree would have rings like this, right? Mm -hmm. All the way down to the center. A good guitar top will have a lot. Sometimes they try to get more than 25. But you know, by looking at the grain structure, you're trying to get it so that it's really, really close. Maybe, maybe we can pass this around again, and then you'll see it more while they're looking at that. So look at the top. You see? And the grain is there. So that's called quarter song. Why? Because when they actually, you see, normally, like if you go to Lowe's and buy some wood, you're going to find all they do is they run, they take a log, and this is cross section, but you think of the log being real long. And then they run it through a, a, a band saw. So it's basically cutting strips like this. You see? So your, your pattern on the wood, you ever see on a two by four or a piece of wood, a lumber, you'll see the various rings, okay? The strongest parts and the most stable parts on a piece of wood happen like this. Because then you're getting all of this section where it's straight, okay? That's what you're getting there. So what they do in order to do this is they actually go and cut this like this. Then they may turn the log and get more like this. Turn the log some more and get more like this. So now your patterns are consistent with quarter sawn lumber. But what's the, what's the issue with that? What would cost more money, just running it through a band saw and letting the machine do it? Or then running it through and then rotating it and getting it at the right place? So, so do you understand why the lumber would, be, would cost more to do? Because just to manufacture the raw materials to make it would cost more, you see? So, and then from that, depending on the wood, so you see that guitar top and you heard it ring, were you able to hear it? Mm -hmm. Y'all tapped it. So you heard the sustain, they say that sustain on that guitar, well, like what I would compare to, what's been compared to me is like, you get a sudden attack, you want a quick attack, but then you want it to resonate. So you hear something like, boom. Some people call it like bell-like. You, you mentioned a drum where it sustains. Here's some material, this is before, it's actually two sides and it's called book matched. So you have a seam in the middle. Sometimes you could even use three pieces depending on what you have, or depending on the width of the board or the, or the size of the tree. So you take the side and you're, you're able to book match it because this side is like a reflect image of this. So that would be the same as having this piece of the tree. And then you take this because you see these grains here would look the same. So you take this and invert it like that. Now you've got matching on each side. Again, that's where it costs more to make things, all right? Now, someone tell me the difference. Let's go like this for me. Don't, 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 not too much. You don't have to do your body, bodybuilding powers here. But just kind of flex it like that a little bit. It bends a little, right? Now, this hasn't been thinned yet. That's just like when they're starting off. Now, do the same thing with this. Okay, you see how that flexes? This is garbage. That's why it's not on a guitar. I thought it would be a good top, but it flexes too much. And in fact, if I were to do that sound thing like we did before, it basically doesn't sound any better than a piece of cardboard. You see? It do, you, see you see, it didn't do anything, it just mm -hmm. that's, that, that's just plain, you know? So that isn't a good top. So there's an example of a person being selective on picking something good, versus using something that has no guts to it, no musical power. What kind of wood is that? That one, I do believe, is elder wood. Someone gave me that because they gave me some lumber from an old cabin. It's from Michigan. So you're talking about turn of the century, past century, 17, 1800s. Sometimes you'll find stuff, and they're gold mines, you know, 
because the material might have been Adirondack spruce or all of these things from old construction that are fine. I still have some old boards that he gave me that are great. But on this particular case, I thought it was going to be fantastic and it ended up being a dud. <laughs> but I use it for this kind of purpose to show people quality versus something that really wouldn't, I wouldn't use. You see, it just sounds like nothing. It just sounds like doesn't, it doesn't have any musical part to it. So you all, so, so that's uh, basically it on that. So any questions so far on, on, on what we do? Bracing, how is it different? Here's the bracing of a steel string guitar. If you notice, it has this X brace. On a classical guitar, they normally won't have X brace. The, back, the guitar will look something, there's different kinds. And in modern, depending on modern day guitars too. I'll leave that up for later. Okay. Okay. So on a classical guitar, you may have a, a horizontal brace here, your sound pole here, another brace here, and then you'll have fan bracing. In fact, if you look at that one that I showed you before, we'll have like fan bracing. And on a flamenco guitar, you leave it open, but on a on a classical guitar, you'll put these kind of closing bars here, and then. Which, is your, which do you think is the most important brace on a guitar? Which, which one is the most important brace? Which one do you see on front? Um, there is a, isn't there a bracing above the one that's above the what's the, bracing, what's the bracing on front that you see? The horizontal. What is that called? Do you know what this part of the guitar is called? Oh, yes, that's a brace. It's the most important brace on the guitar because that's the one that trans transmits the sound to the rest of the guitar. And it's and depending on how you make that is going to determine uh, the, the action and the responsiveness of it. So you build it according to that. So the, uh, some, some people don't look at the, uh, at the bridge as a brace, but it's the most important brace because that's the one that moves and you want that thing to to, to move freely, to get all, the, all the, the string vibrations and transmit that, and of course then it comes out with sound. So that's the most important brace. Something else to look at when you, oh, like I said, everything on a guitar means something. On a, on a steel string guitar when you build it, um, one thing was mentioned uh, about action. Does anybody know what the word, like on action on a guitar, what that means? Um, say, say loud, I mean, you're right on money. Go ahead. How, how high the strings are from the body you make. And why is that important to you as a player? Because it determines like the, like how much, how hard it is. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you like? I, I don't know. No, what do you like? Do you like something that's really hard to press down or something that's no, easy? No, it's something that's relatively easy. Yeah. And it makes a difference. So a good builder is going to build these really down tight to get so that you could get it without it buzzing. Yeah. Unless you're doing a flamenco guitar. That flamenco guitar, you want a little bit of buzz. You want a little bit of raw action to it. You see? So that makes a difference. So you're getting your action down. Now on a steel string guitar, the difference is also when you're building this, on a steel string guitar, the, the neck actually bows back from the body. On a classical guitar, it actually bows towards the body of the guitar. On a flamenco guitar, you want it to bow even a little bit more, and you want this to be very, very close to the bridge because you want it to move fast. Flamenco guitars are moving really, really fast. And, and they want a quick attack, but they also want a quick de delay. Remember on the other guitar, I told you you wanted like a, a long sustain. On a flamenco, you want a quick delay because they're moving, and think of it more as a rhythm you're playing a rhythm for a flamenco dancer. So they want to move from one thing to the other, one thing to the other. They want it to pop, 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 pop. So you build the guitar differently according to that. And the way you do that is you adjust the, your bracing not only on the inside, but on the outside. On a guitar, to attach this top to this body, this wood is very, very thin. So what do you have to do? You have to put uh, like a piece of lining on the inside that may be a little bit thicker so that you could glue the top to the sides. 
Well, that's all I can do today. I wish we could do more. Thank I'm so you. Sorry.